Welcome to the Hoodoo and Chill Podcast, the number one hoodoo and spirituality-based podcast bringing awareness to African-American spirituality and a wide range of thought-provoking topics. I am Papa Seer, your host, your narrator, and your storyteller. Before the show begins, make sure you're subscribed or following the show so you don't miss out on any episodes. And as always, donations of love keep our podcast alive and give us the ability to upgrade the show, enhance our content, and most importantly, do what we love. You can use any link in the description to send your donation of love today. Now, let's start the show. The Hoodoo and Chill Podcast would like to present The Glory of Black, a four-part podcast series dedicated to the lives of African and African-American saints. The saints are considered heroes of the Catholic faith, lives deified with holiness due to their wondrous acts of love and charity. In most ATRs and African-American practices, the saints have been synchronized with spirits, deities, and the Voodoo Loa Pantheon, an esoteric practice used to disguise our once outlawed religions to preserve them. Although these images of Catholicism were not originally correlated with any of our beliefs, the ancestors grew to love and appreciate the power of working with the saints. Because of this, there are many traditionalists to this day who disregard saint veneration as solely a Eurocentric tradition. Hoodoo Conjure Root Work presents this four-part series in hopes to enlighten the world on the Black influence that has transformed the Catholic faith and to give voices to these often forgotten and unknown figures that represent the glory of Black. Good morning and grand rising. We are here with a very special episode of the Who Do and Chill podcast. I am your host, your narrator, and your storyteller for this morning, this evening, wherever you may be, wherever you may be listening to this podcast. Today's episode is a continuation of a series that we started back in January called The Glory of Black, which is a seven, excuse me, a four part series dedicated to venerating the lives and the stories of African as well as African American saints. This series really does mean a lot to me. Ever since I have started talking about the saints, there's been a lot of backlash this podcast has received. And the whole purpose of even just doing these exposés and, you know, finding these stories and telling Black stories from Black voices is to not only just offer a space of veneration, but a space of healing for my people, for us to be able to see ourselves in multiple pantheons as it relates to religion and spirituality. This saint that we're going to talk about today means a lot to me. I had even planned on putting out this episode weeks prior to today, but I'm so glad that spirit You know, I walk by my spirit. I'm always led by my spirit. And today is the perfect day. You know, today is, I believe it's a day for women. It's, what is it? Women's Veneration Day or something like that. I have to go and look this up. But I know that today is a day for women specifically. And what other woman better than to speak of than St. Josephine Baquita? I want to just give a couple of trigger warnings before I get started that her story is... It, it's a hard pill to swallow at some portions, but it's a story that I feel like is necessary and needed, and I'm so excited to tell it today. But I did want to offer those uh, trigger warnings that today we are going to be discussing human trafficking. So if this is something that is going to be too triggering for you, I do understand that. And, you know, if you have to go, that's not a problem either. 
But at the same time, um, this story is very beautiful. It's a story that needs to be told. I am going to have to break this down into two parts because there is a lot of information to cover as it relates to St. Josephine Baquita. So before I get started, I do want to go ahead and just cite a few of my sources. If you yourself are interested in doing your own research or further research on St. Josephine Baquita, you can always look at Wikipedia, also Catholic.org. Books that I would recommend would be Baquita by Veronique Olmi. Movies, Baquita from slave to saint as well as two saint two excuse me two suitcases the story of saint josephine baquita so if you yourself are interested in doing your own research on today's story those are the sources that i use to compile this information as well as being led by my own spirit and personal relationship with this saint as well before we get into her life story You know, I always think it's important to give you all the backdrop of Saint, of whomever that we're speaking of. Because if you don't understand the backdrop of where someone comes from, then you won't understand the events that inspired, you know, whatever it is they did or who it was for the, for these people to become. You need to understand where a person comes from. So as with all of my exposés, I do like to begin um, with a backdrop, as well as my own personal experience with St. Josephine Baquita. I've never, I've never admitted this to you all, but I get stage fright every time I have to do a live show. And even though we've been doing this show or recording on air live for years at this point, I still get a little stage fright a few moments before coming on air. And this particular moment with this particular morning, it was real, you know, because I don't want to mess this story up. And I had my own thing going on this morning where I just felt like how I wanted this morning to flow, it didn't happen, right? So I was sitting in my car and I just started saying this little prayer to St. Josephine Baquita. And I said, you know, give me some of your peace. Out of all of the turmoil and all the things that you've been through, I'm asking, could you give me some peace today? I want to tell this story right. I want to get this. I want to get this out the way that it needs to begin. It needs to come out today. And I know today is the day you want me to do it. And I lied to you now. When I was done meditating and praying and just speaking to her spirit for a second, I looked up and the sun was shining directly through the trees over top of my car. And I promise you, it was like I could see her face in the sun. And my entire body got warm. I felt at peace. The stage fright subsided. And here we are. So before we even get into her life story, if you need some peace today, she is awesome to pray to. If you just need to be calm, she's awesome. And this is so in alignment, you all, because just yesterday, my father... And I was speaking and he said to me, what is it something that you feel like you need more of? And I said, I want to be more peaceful. And then we have this today. So I just wanted to share my own personal experience before getting into her life story. What's up, family? It's Papa Seer, your favorite podcast host of the number one hoodoo-based podcast and spirituality-based podcast wherever you get your podcast. If you haven't taken the time yet, please make sure that you follow the podcast. If you're listening to us on Apple or wherever you can leave a comment, leave us a five-star rating with a comment that really helps the podcast in more ways than you can believe, and it's totally free. But I just want to remind everyone that while this is free content, the Hoodoo and Chill podcast, we thrive and we survive on donations of love. If you have it, if you feel it in your heart to send us a donation of love, we thank you and we pray that whatever you send, it is reciprocated to you three times over. We want to keep this content alive and we want to promote posting this content more regularly. So again, donations of love keep our podcast alive. Comments, five stars, take us to heights that you wouldn't even believe and we need your love and we need your support. 
please use one of the links in the podcast description to send your donation of love. And we graciously thank you all for everything that you do to keep the Hoodoo and Chill podcast on air. Now, back to the show. St. Josephine Baquita was born in 1869. Now, this is significant, very significant before we even get into her whole entire story. I want you all to understand that slavery in America was abolished in 1863. So the events of today's story that you're going to hear transpired years after slavery had already been abolished in America. St. Josephine or Paquita, as we'll call her, because at this moment she's not a saint. This is not her original name. This was a name that was given to her through one of her slave owners throughout her life. The sad truth is that Paquita forgot her name. She had been taken from her homeland so early and had been through so many different homes trafficked so many times before she was even a preteen she forgot her name as well as her original language I want to read to you all an excerpt from her short biography from her own words before we begin my family lived right in the heart of Africa in Sudan There was my father, mother, three brothers, four sisters, and another four who died before I was born. I had a twin sister who, like everything else, I knew nothing about before she was taken away from me. I lived happily not knowing what pain is. The last statement is very significant, even in that short excerpt. Paquita was not just a regular person in her village. She was not just an average everyday citizen. She was born in Darfur, which is now Western Sudan, in the village of Ogosa. She was one of the Daju people. She was a noble. Her father was the brother of the village chief. So before we get any further, I need you all to understand she was basically born a noble princess in her home country. She didn't know about pain, suffering, work, or at least hard work. She grew up a happy, well taken care of child. Now the land of South Sudan, because this is technically where she's from, Before we go further, let's talk about South Sudan, where she comes from. This is a land that even today is still in turmoil with war, genocide, human trafficking, as well as civil conflict and unrest. This is something that South Sudan has experienced for ages. We are taught to venerate Egypt in such a way that it is superior to most civilizations. This is what we are taught as it relates to Africa. We are even taught that Egypt even isn't a part of Africa, right? But what you are not taught is that Egypt, prior to its height, its zenith of civilization, was inspired by Sudan. Sudan was originally called the land of the bow, or as many or some of you may know, the land of Kush. So Bakita was, again, not just 
a regular average citizen. She was also a descendant of the Kushite people who for centuries traded pottery, gold, bronze, textiles. They lived on the River Nile just as well as the Egyptians. As in fact, one of their great cities of karma in Egypt exchanged ideas, all sorts of customs for centuries. Sudan, once upon a time, was a very, very lush country. It's very green, humid, very, very rich in resources. But probably one of the most striking and beautifully placed pieces of this land is that it's protected by the cataracts of the Nile, meaning that the that, that the boats cannot sail into South Sudan for a certain period of the year. So they were protected. The slave trade in South Sudan is nothing new. This is something that's been going on since ancient Egypt. They went into these lands and took these people because of their notability. They were fierce warriors, archers, cream of the crop people, and had been taken from their lands for years and sold into the slave trade. So this, again, is nothing new, something that has been going on for centuries. Now let's get back to the story of St. Josephine Baquita. Let's go back to some of her words in her autobiography. She's now going to talk about her capture. I was about nine years old when one morning I went for a walk in our fields. Suddenly I saw two armed, ugly strangers force their way through a hedge. One of them grabbed me roughly with one hand, but with the other took a large knife from under his belt. He put it against my side and in a commanding voice said, If you shout, you're dead. Come follow us. I was frozen with fear. I can neither speak nor cry. Violently pushed forward, I was made to walk until even my feet and legs were bleeding. I could think of nothing other than my family. I called my mother and father in anguish, but no one could hear me. Hoodoo and Chill Podcast will return after this short ad break. There's a sacrifice that comes with this. And at the end of the day, we're given the choice of how we want to sacrifice and what we're sacrificing for. And whether or not what we're sacrificing for is actually what we're supposed to be sacrificing for. Are we choosing the right path when we accept this proposal that has this bag attached to it? Are we doing that? The Hoodoo and Chill Podcast will return after this short ad break. Why make another major decision without knowing the outcome beforehand? Would you like to know where your relationship is headed or what the future holds in store for you? My name is Papa Seer and I want to assist you in making all the right decisions so that you, yes you, may live your best life. Are you seeking a new career? Does your love life need insight? Or maybe you want to connect with your ancestors or past loved ones. The realm of divination holds all the answers to your fortune. Allow me to use some of my abilities, bone reading, cartomancy, tarot, and mediumship to uncover the answers to your future. Go to hoodooconjurerootwork.com under classes and services to book your appointment today. Your spirit guides are waiting to speak with you. That's hoodooconjurerootwork.com to uncover your destiny 
today. Now, I want you all to understand that she was eight or nine years old when this happened. While doing my research, one thing, one book that I really did enjoy was Bakita by Veronique Omi. And what you won't find in a lot of historical references about Bakita is the fact that she was very beautiful. And that plays a heavy significance into how she was trafficked, where she was trafficked, and why. And I do appreciate um, this book for kind of opening my eyes up to that a little bit more. Because a lot of the historical evidence that you're going to find in her story, whether you're going on Wikipedia or Catholic.org, it's, it's not that good. You're really going to have to fill in the blanks of this. So this is a seven or eight year old child. Excuse me. She wasn't nine. She was seven or eight. That was taken by captives. People that looked like her. These They weren't white. They weren't Arab. They looked just like her. You can only imagine the things that she suffered and saw. Being so young, a girl in the hands of male captors. What the history books don't tell you, and you have to go searching for this information, is that she actually escaped when she was about nine years old. She escaped, her and another girl. And they were running through the woods, or she said they were running all night, and ended up finding, they came to like a hut. And the man, a man came out of the hut and said that he was going to help them. But instead of helping them, he was a sheep farmer. He put them in chains and tied them up in his sheep pen left them there for days for some of the village men to have their way with them. And then he sold them into a harem. What's even worse about this story, or even her life, it's not so much of every owner that she went through, that she went to, excuse me, but my heart really went out to her for the journey. This was a a child being forced to walk all across the deserts of Sudan. And they were going north towards the coast. Along the way, there were these stops called Zaribas. This was in 1856, before Bakita was born. There was a businessman, a slave trader, named Alzubar Rama. He was black. And he began operations in the land south of Dafar. He set up a network of trading posts defended by uh, soldiers. I mean, he was very, very rich. And he set these trading posts up, called Zaribas, along from Sudan up into Egypt, into North Africa. They sold slaves, ivory, everything. Every stop that this child was on, there were a different group of men a different situation, and I really don't want to have to go into the details of that, but I just want you all to have that image in her mind that she, she wasn't, this wasn't like in America where you went from a slave in post directly to your master. No, she went from slave post to post to post. This child walked 600 miles to a city called El Obaid, where there she was sold into a harem. Now, I want you to understand that before before she even got here, she still had no name. She had forgotten her name by this point. When she got to El Obaid, she was sold to a rich Arab who owned a harem. She was the maid for his two daughters. And they specifically picked her because she was so pretty and, you know, she was young and she would be like a good looking slave to have around them. And they gave her the name Baquita, which means lucky one. Because they told her, you're lucky to be our slave. You're going to be treated well. You're going to be, you know, they were, this was a very, very rich man and his daughters were rich. So she was living basically right in their quarters in the lap of luxury. They had a brother, the slave owner, you know, his son. If you look at this situation from the history books, they're going to tell you that there was just, you know, one day he just went crazy and just assaulted her. But I don't believe that this was a harem that they were living in. And I truly believe that this son was either abusing her or trying to, and something happened that day, but whatever it was, he obviously offended the, their brother, the two daughters that she was working for. And he beat her almost until she died. I mean, it was bad. The son beat her so bad. She ran away 
in in Sudan that was you know a slave was not supposed to run if the, the master was beating you you were supposed to sit there and take it but she ran away and she ran into I believe the room of the father and when he saw this he beat her so bad that she almost died so the brother abusing her or forcing himself on her she resisted he beat her she ran for help and then his father beat her as well this was so bad that she had to spend a month on bed rest unable to move now of course at this point you know they feel she's no longer good for the harem she's not as beautiful as she was you know they damaged her they sell her to a turkish general so she's gone from her own culture which is the daju people in south sudan with her own language own customs own culture Then she sold North into Muslim territory to an Arab family. So she's now learning that language and learning their customs. She leaves from there and now she's sold to a Turkish family where she's going to have to learn their language and their customs. So I just need you all to understand just the mental of this. This is a child where she's not even in 20 years old yet. Before all this has happened, this is a child going into her teenage years. Just all of those different situations, customs, and cultures that she was exposed to. Now, I will say this. Children are some of the, are, are just very resilient. The mind of a child is way more powerful than what people give it credit for. What I can say, her having to be forced through this lifestyle and just all of these different exposures to different people and different backgrounds. St. Josephine Baquita was very fluent in multiple languages in her later life. She could speak Arab, she could speak Italian, she could speak Turkish, I believe. I mean, there was a lot. She was very fluent and very language savvy. Even through all of this abuse, even through all of this turmoil, she's learning, she's picking up, she's surviving. I mean, this is a spirit that from childbirth, you could not break her spirit. Most people would have tapped out. But even through all of this turmoil, all of this abuse, she's picking up the customs and learning the language to the point where she's basically a linguist, fluent in multiple languages of multiple continents, Africa, Europe. Wow. However, this is her fourth fourth owner. I'm sorry, the Turkish general. And, you know, as I was doing my research on her, this was probably one of the most, uh, this owner right here, I just, I really, it really broke my heart to hear what happened um, with her at this, at this, at this general's, in this family's house. You know, she, of course, again, was a slave or made into the master's wife, but the mother-in-law lived there as well. And they couldn't stand each other. Like they literally would argue with one another and beat each other's slaves For whoever lost the argument, it was real sick, real sadistic, the stuff that was going on. The, 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 the wife was especially cruel. She got up and beat the slaves every day just because like she woke up and that would be one of the first things that she would do. She would line them up and beat them. All of this is going on years after slavery has been abolished in America. This type of cruelty is going on and still goes on in certain hidden parts of the world. So she's staying here with this Turkish family and the the mother is a sadist, sadomasochist, very much so. So she's waking up every day being beat. Bakita says even from her own words, during all the years I stayed in that house, I do not recall a day that passed without some wound or other. When a wound from the whip began to heal, other blows will pour down on me, meaning that when one would heal, they would open up another one. Now, I think the probably the most traumatic thing that happened during her stay with the Turkish general's family was the process of forced scarification and tattooing. And a lot of us look to this artwork and it, and it is beautiful, you know, but there are some hidden facts about this that a lot of people don't talk about that a lot of times people are unwilling to do this they don't want to do it some of the scarring is on the face and let's just be honest some people don't want to do it and 
this particular master decided one day that she wanted her slaves to have all of these beautiful scars all over their body and and have that. Now, the process of this, again, this is coming in. We're in the 18th century. Very painful. This woman was so random that one day she just said, I want my slaves to look like look like this. She hired um, a girl to come in and do it without even telling Baquita and this other girl. They were about 12 or 13 at this time. And I think the day she pe- picked one other girl who was like six. She was six. Had her bodyguards grab them, hold them down, and they put white flour all over her body and drew symbols. You know, they took white flour to draw out like the outline of how the tattoos were going to be use some little blade or knife and began to cut along these lines of flour, white flour. I remind you, this is a 12 or 12 year old that you're doing this to. She's scared. And one thing about like, I have a lot of tattoos. One thing about tattooing is that, you know, if you're scared, if you're nervous, your, your, your nerves are going to like tense up more and it hurts a lot more especially when you're nervous. You can't really dumb down the pain of a tattoo, but to be more comfortable, you have to just relax, breathe, and just accept the pain so that it can, or think about something else. But when you're 12 or 13 and you don't even know that this is going to happen to you, just somebody snatches you up one day, all of a sudden just start cutting marks all over your body. You're, You're freaking out. You're freaking out. Like, and I'm pretty sure one of those girls either had a panic attack or passed out during the process of this. Like, no 12 year old should be, should be going through something like this without. But as she was doing this, the master was standing over her with a whip and she was beating her. When they were done carving the, the tattoos into her body, they filled them with salt so the scars would be permanent. This 12-year-old suffered a total of 114 cuts and patterns into her breast, belly, and into her right arm. From some of the information that I did read and did find, you know, Baquita really did after that. She um, went through a lot of body issues after that, covering herself a lot. And the six-year-old girl that they did this to, she died. A lot of people don't tell you that a lot. Some people cannot survive this. And then even after they're done, they have, she, she was on bed rest, I think for almost a month or two and then had to go back to work with those scars. And then the infections that were in the scars. Again, you have to remember this is 18th century. There's not a lot of antibiotics and things of that nature. And she's a slave. They're not giving her the best of care. So just think about the, the, the scarring, the smell, bugs getting into those scars. Never looking at your body the same ever again. Like we we go crazy gaining a few pounds, but imagine having to live with something like this from 13 years old. In 1883, after conflict, you know, there was a conflict in the area where she was living and the Turkish general suffered a very deep financial loss and he had to sell all of his slaves. He sold Bakita to a Turkish, Turkish general sold her to an Italian vice council, Callisto Lagani. I take this with a grain of salt, you know, Wikipedia, Catholic.org, and all of those other predominantly Caucasian sources of information are going to say that, you know, this general was nice to her and he didn't beat her and, you know, she begged to go with him and things of that nature. I take all of that information with a grain of salt. Maybe it's true that he did treat her kindly or treat her better or even... I dare to use the word humanely, but at the end of the day, owning someone, how humane can you really be? You know, at the end of the day, owning somebody, I I still have to draw a line with that because if you really cared, you would have just set her free, got her medical medical attention and set her free. You know, you don't own a person and, and treat them nice and own them like there's something wrong with you. But again, This is what the history books will tell you. This is what the predominantly Caucasian sources will tell you when you're searching for this information. So this is why I'm so adamant on, you know, black stories need to be told by black voices, because just little things like that, you will skip over and you'll just you'll take that in and say, okay, well, she was treated nice. And I'm just like, how nice was she treated? She still was a slave. You still was owning her doing whatever to her. You were still a man. I'm siding with St. Josephine Baquita today. So we don't, I'm going to say this, her life was better, so to speak, 
I can't even say that. I can't get that out. Because I just, you know, not to get too much off topic, but I just feel like that's just another way. And I hate to keep doing this, but I just another white way of white people just saying that when she got with a white man, she was okay. I'm not going to do that today. She went from to another slave owner who they claim didn't beat her. But there are other ways of abusing a person simply by owning them. So I'm going to say that. I can't get that out for some reason. Back to the story. She stayed with this uh, Italian council. I want to say for about two years until another conflict boat broke out and they had to make, I want to say a almost 500 trek across Sudan to Italy. It was very, very tumultuous. So when they got to, when they got to Italy, this council who was so good to her sold her again. And this is why I just say like, I can't, accept that because like if it was all of that why didn't you keep her you know as soon as they were done and they got on the shores of italy he sold her so i don't know if maybe it was because you couldn't be seen in italy with your black african slaves with her 114 cuts along her breast and legs but i don't know he sold her again but this time he sold her to an italian family that lived only 16 miles from venice family name was michelle she was sold to uh Maria Torina Michelli. So she was sold to the Michelli family when she got to Italy. This is up. This is very debatable. Her time being spent in this home, because one of the movies that I watched, it was very much under the guise of her life was a little bit better, but even still, like the rest of the servants were in that space. They treated her poorly. There was a lot of racism, um, a lot of prejudice that was being displayed towards her. She was not, you know, the best taking care of servant in that vicinity. And it also hinted at the master having relations or abuse there in that aspect. So, you know, again, when we talk about how well she was treated at the hands of europeans i'm still on the fence with that you know um, it may not have been as quote-unquote brutal or maybe we don't know as what her time was spent in sudan and, and through that particular slave trade but at the same time it's, it's still slavery right so what i do know is that during her time with the Michelles, she did form a relationship with their daughter and she became their nanny. And that was a good space for her. She did enjoy the little girl and just, you know, teaching her about her life and taking care of her. So I will say, even from Baquita's own words during this time, um, you know, she was a little bit better. So This story, of course, we're going to have to come back to this on our next episode of The Glory of Black. And we're going to talk more about when she was canonized as a saint, her life at the convent, as well as how to work with Saint Baquita, some rituals, novenas that you can say to her, and just how you can experience her in your own life. I personally say, for those of you that are interested or if you just feel a connection with her, pray to her for some peace you know she seems to really come through very fast for that you know this was a woman who never really had anything i don't consider going to her for money or anything like that but if, if we're talking about peace if you're talking about resilience if you're talking about courage or just the ability or the need to survive she's definitely a great saint for that she is also a patron saint for those of you that don't know of sex workers of course you know here we don't do we don't discriminate we don't judge anyone and whatever life walk of life you choose but if that is your industry this is also a saint that you can have in your spiritual court that will protect you because she's been through a lot um as it relates to that world or if you are someone who unfortunately may have experienced trafficking and you are in need of healing or additional healing or protection this is also an amazing saint for you as well saint baquita has many different stories that we can go into about her but before you know i wanted to get into her canonization and all of the beautiful things that are related with her i did want you all to understand where she came where she comes from i know that this was maybe a harder park podcast to listen to 
Um, some of you may even be in tears today and I totally understand it. There were a few times me even just, you know, speaking today, I choked up because this is a real story. This really happened. This, this, these are things that unfortunately, even in the world today still go on, but she went through all of these things for a reason. And even throughout them, she never changed her beautiful heart, her beautiful spirit. And if you are in need of some peace today, regardless of what life may be throwing at you, I implore you, St. Baquita is someone that's waiting for you. Just pray to her like I did this morning. And, I, and I'm and i telling you, I felt like just this instant calmness and this peace. And I knew she was there. And that is one thing I can say about Every Catholic that I have come across that talks about her, the information that I have looked into about her, people put an emphasis on being able to feel that she was there. And I experienced that today. Like a real, like there are times when we pray to certain deities and certain spirits and we kind of like, I hope you're there. I hope you're listening. With, 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 with Bakita, it's not like that. It's like this instant comfort that you feel with her you know she's listening you know give it a try for those of you who feel a pull to her but this this isn't your thing and you're just here for the history i totally get it too but for those of you who work with saints you know this is something that i really do feel um she isn't she isn't one that you want to skip over no matter what your walk of life is i also want to just say that this show today was dedicated to one of my been teased one of my students and just someone that I'm very very proud of on their on their spiritual walk and that is my student Karen you know I started you know talking about the saints and this was something that was very very she resonated with this so heavily just to watch someone come into their walk and find what works for them and to see the benefits of it you know that's that's what I that's what it, it what I'm here for and what makes my job just even the more fulfilling because we're all going to have different paths. I got so much backlash and I still do for talking about black people working with Catholic saints. But to see a woman of color say, this resonates with me. I feel the love. I want to do this. And to see it actually working for her in her life. You know, I, this is why I do the things that I do and the way that I do them. And I don't care about other people's opinions, traditions, hurt that they're trying to hold on to. We have to step outside of that. And find what works for us, whether it's hoodoo, Christianity, saint worship, Catholicism, Buddhism. I don't care. It's your life. It's your journey. And if you open yourself up to the right spiritual court and the right spiritual guides, I promise you, my friend, my family, my people, they will come flooding in those who you need. I look forward to telling part two of this beautiful saint, St. Josephine Baquita, which will be a much easier podcast. It won't be so tumultuous as all of this, but we have to know where she comes from to understand her power and her glory. Again, you all, this has been the glory of black. I want to remind each and every last one of you that no matter where you are listening, that you are important. You are strong. You are powerful. You are significant. Your spiritual core is growing. It's golden. It is filled with exactly what you need, when you need it, and whom you need. I want you all to remember today as you go out that you are blessed. You are protected. You are loved. And that your bloodline is divine. I bless your hands. May everything that you lay your hand on may be, may it be a spirit of riches. And I don't just mean money, but may it also materialize as if it were gold, as if you had the Midas touch. I send you all out today in love, peace, and most importantly, protection. And with that, my people, I release you into the atmosphere. Thanks for listening to the Hoodoo and Chill podcast. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a five-star rating and let us know how much you enjoyed the show. As always, donations of love keep our podcast alive and give us the ability to enhance our content. Please use one of the donation links in the description to send a donation of love today. 
and we'll see you on the next episode of Hoodoo and Chill.